All right, so welcome back to another video on Node.js, specifically talking about sockets. So with socket, <clears throat> let's go to imagine, let's going to make a thought bubble. Let's go to the thought bubble, okay, to make a thought experiment. So let's imagine that we're going to build a chatter, okay? So with all the things that we know so far, if we want to send a message, we perform a post request. If we want to read all the message, we do again. <clears throat> but the question is, when do we know when to fetch data? Data that is outside of a control. Data that is created by someone else that we didn't create. Or that might be in their own life cycle. <clears throat> So, data that is impossible to predict. Often, we deal with this kind of situation with a, a very efficient approach called polling, where you send a get request so often in a period of time, and when that time has passed, you send a get request again in a loop essentially. So this might be a good approach, for example, for example creating a chat application uh, by using is the set interval C to go here where we needed to send is a get request to read all of this data. <clears throat> this approach might come with some issues like how do we know when to fetch data? Or is there even a right period of time to do that? Doesn't the data depend, or doesn't it depend on how often the data change on the backend? So for a chat app, 500 millisecond delay will add 500 millisecond delay for all of updates. So this might be good or acceptable for this type of application, but what about real stuff such as self-driving cars, trading, or games? So, even though for this scenario, for this chat application, we have two requests per second and 120 requests in a minute. So, and this is just for one single user. So, imagine when you scale that up. Now, <clears throat> that is when sockets come to the rest. And sockets, they are just a opening or a hole or a hollow uh, that form a holder for something from the definition of Mary Webster. So in other, in other words, in data context, in the software engineering context, data socket is an opening in a computer system, a com programmable computer, a programmable machines that can perform logic and arithmetical operation automatically, and that is made up of hardware, software, the OS is the main software, and it is peripheral, such as keyboard, mouse, speaker, monitor, in the case of desktop, uh, but in laptops, everything builds in, everything comes built in. <clears throat> so, this opening, this data socket, which are opening this computer system in which you can connect before. Uh, or in which you can connect to send and receive the data is a holder for this connection in computer networks or network computers. So these computer networks, okay, are a series of nodes or computers sharing resources located on similar as the people on a country okay so this might see so you might see this computer or this network computer 
as people living in a country where they shared music, fluids, literature, knowledge, and so on. But in this case, these computers share a resource they are located on, similar as the humans in a country. Okay, they are located in a particular place, right? And this on computer network, this series of or this collection of computers that okay, this this collection of computers that are at shared resource located on or provided by network nodes, either at a distribution point. For example, DGP, uh, Border Gateway Protocol, which is a protocol to exchange routing data between different autonomous systems. Interconnected network uh, that operates under a single domain. So, for example, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Verizon. You know, so these autonomous systems are similar as the countries where inside of this network, or you can think of this as autonomous systems as networks, okay, An interconnected network, much like states in a country or blast or province, okay, they are interconnected. Uh, and they operate under a particular domain in the case of this interconnected uh, network all right and in the con so the thing here is this so you have interconnected network a bunch of computer connected each other sharing resource right under uh, that it operates under a particular domain such as Google in a real life example, you might see like people on states, right? The people on the states, where you have interconnected routes uh, from different uh, states, right? And inside of these states, there are people, right? That they can move abroad states, right? And they live by a particular state. Ohio, Nebraska, Miami, New York, Florida, Texas, you name it, right? So this is an analogy that you can bring, especially when you try to explain to someone new uh, this type of concept, right? So when someone tells you, hey, what is a computer? What is a network computer? You can explain that that is somewhat similar to the avenues that connect different states on the state in this in the United States, right? So where inside of this states there are people in there, right? That they share each other, and people can be thought as computer as this network. All of this computers are connected to share resources, similar as we are in a city or a, con or a community. So we share resources, so we share food, gossips, fluids, culture, literature, knowledge, uh, insults, you name it. You exchange this, right? So, uh, because this interconnected network it operates under a admin, under a single admin domain, in this case, maybe Google or Facebook, very soon, Cloudflare, much like similar as the state, such as Ohio, Nebraska, Washington, D.C., Washington State, uh, California, uh, yeah, California, well, yeah, uh, New Mexico, Texas, Miami, Wisconsin, blah blah. You know, right? 
that's the analogy from the real life example. Uh, and that's something very, very interesting, though. very, very, very interesting to share. Okay, so this autonomous system, okay, that a node, which can be a, a redistribution point, such as BGB protocol, which is a router that interconnect in an exchange uh, routing data from different autonomous systems, okay? Or it can be a communication of endpoint. So an IP address or an address that identifies the communi that communication entity, such as a service or application or a device. So, for example, you have computers, servers, firewalls, uh, and to understand. So, the, the reason of looking at this is to understand again the definition of nodes uh, depend on on the network and protocol layer refers to. Okay. But in any case, understand what a computer system is, and you can explain that in, in plain English because this is something that I can explain on Spanish, but I didn't know how to do that in on English. That's different. Okay? Uh, and you have this computer network, uh, explain that definition of computer networks, okay? So these two concepts with the computer system uh, and the computer networks, so this communication of data is what the internet is based on and something that is to me very exciting to learn and to explain. So the basic building block on this is the IP socket. Uh, and on top of that, you have this a diagram where low latency is more important. You also have is a TCP socket where this is uh, connection based. So before you send or receive a message, you need to connect. And they're also reliable because you can know if a message has been received or not. So on top of the TCP connection, this TCP socket, you have HTTP, all right, and the web socket. So the most important thing as web developers and back uh, or back end developers is the concept of web socket that is a JavaScript features that allow this two way communication uh, between the user server the user client, the user browser, and the server, okay? And this is where the real power is, because compare socket with polling, with polling using HTTP, which mimic is this two-way communication, uh, this is not a, a great approach, because you can quickly flood your server with incoming requests. Whereas in the socket, it opens a channel between the browser and the server to allow real-time communication, RTC. So by having this channel open, sockets allow this two-way ongoing communications to happen. So I look at an implementation of that, something that I'm quite familiar with this. Okay, uh, And this approach is revolutionary. So for centralized communication uh, when for centralized two-way data binding communication socket is a good approach is a great approach by the way it's revolutionary because now the server is responsible to keep the client up to date so the client doesn't need to guess when to send requests asking for data so this might come with a trade-off, you know, even though this might come with some trade-off, 
uh, but it's important to at least recognize it is most helpful use case in sockets, right? For centralized two way that I communication, sockets are a great deal. And then I look at the web socket. That to me is something important, to do, right? So re recognize that sockets recognize the most common use case for sockets allow you to bring value to the company. Since socket, since web socket, allow two way communication, two way, two way data communication. For real time communication, okay. data exchange, okay. Since web sockets allow two way data exchange for real time communication, to recognize the, the most common use case for sockets allow you to bring value uh, for the company needs. for the company needs. Okay, so since we started to allow you two-way data exchange for RTC, recognize the most common use case for sockets allow you to bring value for the company needs. Mm -hmm. Recognize the most common use case for sockets for web socket. Allow you to bring, recognize, uh, recognize him. Recognizing the most common use case for web sockets allow, allows you to bring value, mm -hmm. allows you to bring value, uh, allows you to bring value to the company name. Based on based on companies need like this based on the companies need so this is the TLDF for WebSocket as theory and how you can apply that on the industry right allows Two-way data exchange for real-time communications. Recognize the most common use case for web sockets allow you to bring value based on the company's need. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are implementing vastly chat app or chatbot to have this you know, RTC uh, with users, especially on the. Uh, on the uh, customer service, for example, right? So, okay. So now that I'm looking here at WebSocket, okay? Uh, so we have seen how Socket changed the workflow chat model from a traditional HTTP model to a WebSocket, okay? So with Socket, it changed the workflow of the chat model. Important thing here, right? So just like HTTP protocol has different implementations to get data from the server in different API libraries, such as Axios or NodeFetch, just like HTTP, WebSocket 
can have different uh, implementation and the most common is uh, a Node.js WebSocket library. The issue with this is this only works on the server, not in the browser. And if you want to make use of that, well, you need to rely on another package that is not quite popular. So, for example, it's a Morphic uh, WS. However, however, again, go like this. However, however, we can look here at node. No, uh, wait, where? No. There's no. Okay. We take a look at the socket. Mm -hmm. Then is this right the website? <clears throat> Change our chat flow from the traditional HTTP model, where a client makes requests against the server by pulling it. And we're going to skip over sockets. And that the module does not work WebSocket object. And we can see here that it similarly provides functionality to create a WebSocket and to add event listeners for different types of events. Like This is an example of WebSocket, right? You need to connect, after all, is based on TCP sockets, which are connection-based. Before sending and receiving data, you need to connect. And it's also reliable because you know when you send a message uh, if that message was received or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me go back here. We got socket. Okay. Be open or the message functionality to create a WebSocket and so if we wanted to use WebSockets in the client in our browser, we would need we can also see that the interface, the API for this client side side, we're using this add event listener instead. And apart from the API being different, if a browser doesn't support this WebSocket protocol, our application will fail. We won't be able to receive messages. Exactly. So there's a, a, a quite um, a quite trade-off of this. So if we want just to rely purely on web socket object if a if a client or if a browser browser doesn't support that we we are not able to use you use it. Just in the browser. Hmm. Well, what if there was one higher level convenient library that works on both the front end and the back end? However, there is one top level convenient, convenient, convenient library that works in both end from the client and server client and server call socket 
and provides fallbacks in case the browser doesn't support the WebSocket. Exactly. And provide whole um, fallback in case the socket or in case the browser doesn't support website. Protocol. Socket IO to the rescue. Socket.io is one of the most popular Node packages, and it makes it extremely easy to use WebSockets on both the front end and on the back end using the same interface. We'll dive into this in the next video. I'll see you then. Welcome back. We're getting to the fun stuff. So what is this Socket.io library, and why are we going to use it over something like the native WebSocket API or the Node.js WS library? Why is Socket.io so widely used when working with real-time applications in Node.js, like Pong games and chat applications? In short, Socket.io provides a lot on top of those standard native APIs for Node and the browser. Socket.io is a library that allows us to do real-time communication on every platform, every browser, without having to worry about compatibility issues. It's used by professional large-scale projects like Microsoft Office and Trello, a popular application used to schedule tasks and stay organized. We can see here one of the main differences with the bare bones Node.js WebSocket module, which is that we can use Socket.io for our client side as well as our server side code using the same library. This means we don't have to worry about juggling two different APIs with two slightly different sets of functionality and can instead focus on building our application code. It allows us to save our brain power for creating new and exciting functionality as opposed to hunting bugs and worrying about API compatibility between the client side and the server side. We'll always have bugs, but if we can minimize them by even 10 to 20% just by using one API, we'll be saving ourselves a lot of time. We'll be learning a lot more about these two components of the Socket.io library very shortly, as well as the excellent high-level APIs that it provides us. But there's one other perk that I wanted to bring up, which is important when building large production scale applications and that is the fallbacks. When we start up our chat application on the client side, the Socket.io library will attempt to establish a WebSocket connection between the server and the client. And if the client is one of the less than 3% of browsers that don't support WebSockets, Socket.io sticks to a form of polling, similar to what we saw earlier. This way, you're guaranteed to have your application run on all devices. Very important in a corporate enterprise environment. Now that we've sampled what Socket.io can provide for us, let's dig a little deeper at the implementation. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. We've seen that Socket.io is composed of two parts, a server library, which will integrate with the Node.js HTTP server, and a JavaScript client-side library that loads on the browser side. These live in two separate GitHub repositories. We have Socket.io for the backend, and we have Socket.io client for the front end when we're using JavaScript. But even if we wanted to create a client in another language, say Java or C++, there are implementations of Socket.io which we could use to talk to our Node.js Socket.io server. So this is a very versatile library. There's even bindings for Dart and Swift. And if we scroll up here to the Learn section, we can see that there's a server API and a client API. So the functions that we'll be using aren't exactly the same, but this makes sense because as we're about to see, the client and server need to support different sets of capabilities. They have different roles. Remember our chat example? With sockets, like with HTTP requests, on the client side, we always talk to the same server. We'll only ever send messages to that server. However, on the server side, sockets allow us to send messages to any one of the many clients that are connected. So say we had another client that connected to our server that joined the chat room. The server would be responsible for sending any updates, any new messages to that new client, whether it be the original hello message or a message from any other client. So our server needs to be connected to and sending messages to multiple clients at the same time. 
This is different than the HTTP requests that we've already seen, where the server will always send a response to the client that made the corresponding request as a response to that request. With sockets, the server can decide when to send messages to the client. What does this difference mean for our socket API? It means that our server will need to support some additional functionality over the client. For example, by keeping track of the multiple clients that are connected to it, and by having the ability to send messages back and forth between these clients individually, or to broadcast messages to all of them at once. For example, when the server receives a new message, it needs to notify all of the clients of that new message by broadcasting it. The reason behind Socket.io's success is the excellent high-level API that it provides for both the server and the client. In the server API, as well as in the client API, it uses the node event emitter pattern around which node's core APIs are built. If we remember, with the event emitter pattern, every action that occurs in node, like a connection being opened or a message being sent, every one of these actions can be represented as a named event, which can be emitted using this emit function. So for example, in our socket, we could call the exact same corresponding emit function on our socket. And this would send a message to the client connected on that socket. However, it's also common to want to broadcast a message to all clients. For example, when the server receives a new chat message. And there's this handy emit cheat sheet. If we go to the documentation page and go to the emit cheat sheet here, we can see all the different ways in which we can send a message or emit a message in Socket.io. Now, don't worry. We don't need to be familiar with all of these functions. Right now, let's take a look at the most common example, which is broadcasting messages to all the clients. We can see that we have the default emit function where we name our event and then pass some data to it that will be sent to a single client. We also have this socket.broadcast.emit function, which has a similar payload of a named event and some data. And we can see that this will send to all the clients except the sender. So all the clients except the one that is connected on the socket. We would use this, for example, in our chat. When we receive a message on the socket, we can then call socket.broadcast.emit and forward that message to all the clients except the one who originally sent it, because that client will already have that message. Now, in some cases, we'll want to send a message to all the connected clients, including the sender. For that, we have this io.emit function, where we send some data to all the clients that are connected to our socket server. If we compare this to the lower level WS package, which works just on the server, it actually has some usage examples where it implements this higher level functionality from the functions that it provides. So if we wanted to broadcast using the WS library, we can see that to broadcast to all clients, including the one we're currently receiving a message on, we would have to do several lines where we respond to a message and then go over a list of clients that are stored in our WebSocket server. And for each client, check if it's ready to receive data, and if so, send it the data that we just received. This would be one line in Socket.io. And we have a similar function here for broadcasting to all the clients except the one that we're receiving on. So similarly, we go over the list of clients, make sure that the client is ready, and check to make sure that the current client in our list is not the one that we're receiving on. Just with this simple example, we can see that Socket.io makes our life easier for the most common usages of WebSockets, while also allowing us to build reliable production scale applications, for example, by taking advantage of the fallbacks that we discussed earlier. All right, it's about time we got to some coding, don't you think? I'll see you in the next one. So that'll be all for this video. Take care, bye-bye.